You guys want to stand up? Well, I mean, you're going to, but let's just do it. All right. We're going to worship. Be happy because it's sunshiny out 
outside. Yeah. Right? We can go to parks and play basketball. We're going to do a song that was a little slower. It's called Shadow Feet. And I enjoy it a lot. It's a song that I sing when I'm by myself in my apartment. That's personal and too much information, but um, <laughs> but it's one of those songs that I sing, and I had this experience with a song this weekend at my church actually. But there's times when you when you worship and you're not really feeling it, or you're not really believing that God is with you, and uh, your heart just might be in a funky place. And I spend a lot of times like that in prayer, praying something that I really, truly want to believe, even if I don't really believe it at that moment, and just pray that God changes my heart and, and that I will. And this is, this is one of those songs. Uh, so if you've never heard it before, just take time to kind of sit back and listen to the words, look at them on the screen. If you know it, sing along. Stumbling on these shadow feet to a homeland that I never seen. I am changing as sad as I sleep, made of different stuff than when.
salvation is here. And um, multitasking is never been one of my in my strong points. So we'll just let me finish tuning that. Now I feel like we can fully, you know, hold the conversation even though I'm the only one with the microphone. So salvation is here. Um, in like in the in the first verse, the sign says like out above all the world motion. Um, and that for me hits home because I know so often I um, I live like my relationship with God is my kind of when I go to church and that's all it is because my life is so busy and so I justify it by saying like when my life's not busy then like I'll have a relationship with God and until then I'll just kind of go to church and like put on a mask and do that um, and we're getting nowhere with that and I, I see too many people fall into that trap and it sucks, we gotta be honest, it sucks. So, all of that being said, um, we are saved, um, Christ is our salvation. So let's not forget that, let's not live the Christian life, but let's, you know, let's truly know Christ, not just show up and, uh, and go through the motions. Salvation is here.
you um, for this opportunity to gather. I know we're called to community. And I thank you for providing this place. Um, and I thank you for this group of people called The Realm. Uh, I pray that you would just manifest yourself here tonight, that we would see that, um, that we would still our hearts enough to see you move, um, because we know that you can in powerful ways. And just now I pray. Amen. Okay, thanks, guys. Let's, let's go ahead and jump in over your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. We've uh, we successfully taken two weeks to get through the first chapter of Philippians. We're going to jump into the second chapter tonight and get rolling. We're going to bring up house lights just a little bit so uh, we can take notes and we can roll. Thanks, guys. Um, hey, uh, man, I love what Ellie said before they before they say shout out for you real quick. I mean, she said a great, a great phrase. Isn't it sometimes we find our hearts in a funky place? Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't feel like my heart's in a funky place tonight. Like, I don't, I don't feel that. But yeah, because isn't it just, isn't spring break just a different texture of life, right? We talk about this every year. So as we jump into this, let, let's go ahead and take, take the obvious. Let's, let's talk about the obvious real quick. And then let's jump in and continue our journey through Philippians. But the obvious is this. I say this every single year. I said this Sunday night at Origins. But if you are wondering what college potentially is going to be like for you, if you were wondering potentially what college is going to be like for you, if you wanted a quick glimpse of college, spring break is it. Spring break is it. Even if you don't travel anywhere, even if you, if you stay, especially if you stay local in your hometown, it's a good little indication of college. And what I mean by that is during spring break, we're doing everything that we possibly can do to not do anything. Okay? And in the midst of that, I mean, we can chuckle, we can laugh at that. That happens in college. And also what happens in college is we do everything that we can do to advocate responsibility. So if there's anything that I can do just to not take responsibility, because I know that I have responsibility, but I'm going to do everything I can to try to advocate, to try to shift that responsibility onto someone else. And so we get a glimpse. If you are lazy, if spring break is a time for you to be lazy, and you use spring break as an excuse to be lazy, I'm telling you guys, that's naturally what's going to happen during college. It just naturally will. Why? Because you have the opportunity to do it, and so you just do it because it's natural. And so I always warn people during times of spring breaks that spring break is a good little glimpse. It's a good picture. And so if you're sitting here and it's like Thursday and you haven't done anything and you've stayed up really late and you've slept in really late, like that's a good picture of, what's, of what college is going to do for you. Well, what college is going to be like for you. So in the, in, the, in the sense where you don't have, quote, unquote, the authority figure over you when you're in college, that's just what happens. And so, we, again, we show up to church tonight. And again, if you're here for the first time or you're relatively new, again, unapologetically, we call this church. But if you show up to church tonight, it's very difficult to try to get something out of, out of just hoping that maybe there's something there. Maybe... Maybe there's something there. I know it's probably in jest, but someone earlier said, is it going to be good tonight? Like, if you show up and, you, and your expectation is, is it going to be good tonight? I'm going to question your heart and the place that your heart's at currently, because it should never be whether it's going to be good or not. It should always be where the overflow of your heart is, right? Worship is always the overflow of what Christ is doing inside of us. Worship is always the overflow of what the gospel is continuing to restore in our lives. And so when we show up and, and we ask, again, I know it was most mostly a jest, but again, if we show up and we have that disposition, church just doesn't make sense, right? Showing up, and again, if we call this the gathering of, of followers of Jesus, church just doesn't make sense. And so let's jump in, Philippians chapter 2. We're starting late tonight. And so, um, take a deep breath, because I think I'm going to have to talk a little fast, right? When I, when I preach um, a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning, I had a little old lady come up to me. Oh, Martha, she's so sweet. A little lady come up to me, she said, um, uh, she said, you, you, you said enough words for three sermons this morning. You talk so fast. But uh, let's jump in chapter two. Chapter two. Now, here's where we go with chapter two. Here's where we're at. If you're here, let me, if you haven't been here last week or the week before, let me catch you up. Chap basically, in chapter one, we find Paul. In, in, in the beginning, the salutation of this letter that he's writing to the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi is in a Roman colony. So he's writing to mostly Gentiles, people who aren't Jews. Not to mention that the church in Philippi has become it's the first church in Europe. Literally, the first Christian church in Europe. So he's writing to them. He's in prison in Rome. 
He's, he's awaiting trial. There's a good chance that he's been there for about two years now. He's probably 20 plus years into his quote unquote missionary journeys, into his travels, into his teaching and preaching and discipling and, and planting churches. And so he's tired. So we find Paul in prison, again, probably in Rome, and he's probably chained to a guard. He's probably dictating to Timothy, most likely. And Timothy is writing down his letters. He's writing down his letter. We find Paul in a normal salutation, in a normal letter. We find him opening up, and he's basically in the first chapter telling what the rest of the letter is going to be about. So he tells him that he's proud of him. He shows thanksgiving. He's, he shows the overflow of gratitude in the heart for the church in Philippi by spreading the gospel, for them literally being a living representation of Christ. And then we see him begin to pray. When he gets, begins to pray, we, we see Paul praying for the same exact things that he was just thankful for. The things that he's thankful for, we see him beginning to pray. So from the first chapter, we learn from Paul that he prays for the things that he's thankful for. He's thankful for the things that he prays. Again, we said this last week. If you wake up and you see the sun and it's unbelievable, I mean, it's spring now. And how many are still absolutely screwed up by the ridiculous time change, right? I mean, we've given time in the hands of our government and it doesn't make any sense. Man, I, I'm just, I'm all messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted right now. I'm actually fine. And so, what we're, so we find Paul, we find Paul praying for the things he's thankful for and being thankful for the things that he begins to pray for. And again, we see the habit, if we wake up and we see the sun and we feel the warmth of the day and we immediately are thankful, I mean, most likely if our hearts are in the place that they ought to be in, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities, no pun intended, to find ourselves praying, just being thankful when we're thankful we begin to pray because what happens is it's a natural response of the overflow of what God's doing in our life. And so we see Paul just naturally praying for the things that he's already been thankful for. He prays that their love may abound more and more in the knowledge, in the knowledge of who Christ is. Why? So that they may have a depth of insight so that would be blameless. Essentially what Paul's praying for is that the church of Philippi, there's internal strife, there's some relational tension going on. We'll figure that out not this week, but next week. But there's some relational tension going on, and he's calling the church of Philippi, he's calling to the mat. And he's saying, you, on some level, you get it. Because my prayer is that your love may abound more and more. So on some level, they get it. On some level, they're loving each other deeply. The gospel is being spread. They're literally shining like stars in the darkness of the Gentile world of the Roman colony and of Philippi. And so we see on some level that they get it. But his prayer is that they get it more and deeper. And it doesn't wait until the day of Christ that they get it here and now. So again, we see the glimpses of Paul in the first chapter, in the opening of this letter, saying this life is reality here and now, and I'm grateful for you guys. I want to be proud of you guys, but I'm praying that you continue to do it even deeper and greater and more than you've been doing it for the past. Make sense? Chapter 2. Verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit. At this point, what we find out is that the NIV has, has translated some funky things. And again, remember, I, 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 I preach the NIV just because the vast majority of you guys have it. But some funky things have been translated here. Really, in the beginning, if you have any encouragement. There's a word almost left out, a phrase almost left out here that's been translated this way. Really, at this point, it can almost mean like, therefore. Therefore, if any have, if, if you have any encouragement, therefore, what do we know? Whenever we see the word therefore in the scriptures, what do we know? We need to ask the question, what is it there for? When we ask that question, we immediately have to get in the context. In order to get in the context, really, in the original, in the original setting, there's not really a break from, in chapter 1, verse 27, there's not really a break from verse 27 flowing into chapter 2. So this really is a continuation starting in verse 27. And in verse 27, back in the first chapter, again, we see the same type of language. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Remember, at this point, Paul shifts from the narrative from verse 26 up. And from verse 27 on, he speaks in the imperative. He gives them commands. He's no longer just trying to tell them or encourage them, but now he's giving them commands. He's speaking or writing in the imperative. And as he writes in the imperative, basically what he's saying is, it's time to get your act together. It is time for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel, whatever quarrels you have among you, it's time to come together. It's time to act 
together. And then he goes on to say, then whether I come and see you only or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. One spirit, contending as one man. So we automatically, verse 27, verse, and in chapter 1, we begin to see this unity, this language of unity. Go back, chapter 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement, from being united with Christ. So encouragement comes from Christ. If you have any encouragement from being united, again, language of unity, being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, that word comfort means solace. That's the word solace, but literally means uh, almost a refuge from, from despair, a ref refuge from an, an uncomfortable situation. So if you have any solace from his love, again, everything pointing back to Christ, encouragement from Christ, solace from his love, and again, his, if you would notice, um, it's not a capital H. You see this? It's not a capital H, which, again, biblically we see that it's probably not talking to God, but what we know, New Testament scholars over and over refer to this love back in Christ, whether he's talking about the love from the community or not, everything funnels through the love of Christ, any souls from his love, and any fellowship with the Spirit. Fellowship, again, that word fellowship, right there is the word koinia. Back in the first chapter, in verse 5, I believe, because of your partnership, that word partnership is the same word here. It's the word koinia. Again, literally means to participate in or to participate with. It happens through experience. It happens with proximity. If we will not have any koinia if there's no proximity. So I can say, I know you, but if we don't have any proximity and we don't live life together, that's not koinia. That's not fellowship. That's not partnering. That's not participating with each other. And here he's saying the participation is koinia with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. What I love about this real quick, Paul, as he jumps in, as we jump in here, Paul, again, he's continuing in the same language. He's continuing the same language. At this point, Paul recognizes the sin of the Philippians. He recognizes it again because he's already talked about it in the first chapter. He's already alluded to what's coming. What is he alluded to? He's alluding to some selfish ambition. He's alluding to things that people are doing things with the wrong motives. And so we call that biblically sin. So Paul recognizes the sin that's forthcoming, but yet how does Paul handle other people's sin. Again, I tweeted this out earlier this week, but my question up front is, how do you deal with other people's sin? When you recognize someone else's sin, how do you deal with it? When you recognize that somebody has, quote unquote, wandered from the truth, if we're going to borrow language from James, James chapter 5, verse 19, if one of you has wandered from the truth, what ought to bring them back? How do we bring people back to the truth of the gospel? I met with a buddy last night who in some ways, not entirely, but in some ways, has wandered from the truth. We met, we were up till 12.30, we met for three and a half hours, and we were talking about wandering back to the truth. If I wouldn't have read this text, there's potentially, I would have approached that conversation last night, potentially incorrectly, maybe not even incorrectly, but just maybe with the wrong motives. But when you recognize someone else's sin, we know in James chapter 5, verse 19, we're called to bring them back to the gospel. How do we bring them back? If we're going to borrow language from Paul, back in Ephesians, he says, always bring someone back in love. Always love people back to the truth. Always love people back to the truth. Get in the trenches with them and love people back to the truth. And again, everyone's looking for truth and love. Really, they're looking for love and truth in that order. They don't care what you say. My buddy last night, it wouldn't have mattered what I had to say. It could have been right. But if I wouldn't have said it in love, it wouldn't have mattered what I had to say. How do we love people back to the truth of the gospel when they've wandered away from the truth? What do we see Paul here? When he recognizes their sin, notice, notice he doesn't just bash them. But it says, it says, if any tenderness and compassion. We see Paul immediately doing the same exact thing that he's been doing from the beginning of the letter. We see him stepping into humility. We see him stepping into tenderness and compassion. Tenderness and compassion can be translated as humility and love. We see Paul coming from a place and a form of humility. We see Paul not above. We see Paul not even necessarily below, but we see Paul walking beside, even though he's from a distance. 
Even though he's in prison in Rome, you see Paul literally walking along side lengths and loving them back to the truth in tenderness and in compassion. The word compassion means that we recognize it, but that we do something about it. Because if we don't do something about it, that's just sympathy. And if we take it even deeper, that's just empathy, right? So I can empathize and I can sympathize with where you're at. I can sympathize and empathize with the fact that you've wandered from the truth of the gospel. But it doesn't mean that I have compassion. It means I have compassion when I want to do something about it. And then I actually do something about it. But that's what it means to have compassion and tenderness. It denotes, again, this humility. It denotes this, his, his desire to want to be soft and to want to be tender, but yet to bring truth. By the way, tenderness and compassion ought to always, always be the expression of the church. Tenderness and compassion ought always be the expression of the church. Why? Because tenderness and compassion has been shown to us. Yes? Through the gospel, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in his tenderness and in his compassion, in his sympathy and empathy for where we're at, where humanity was, he loved us so much that he just didn't sympathize and empathize with us, but in fact, he had compassion on us, and he did something about it, all the way to the cross. Here, Paul follows that same exact thing with tenderness and with compassion, verse 2. Then, again, shifts to the imperative. He shifts and gives him a command. Then, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. We see him shift here. We see, again, the threefold relationship Paul's having throughout this entire letter. We see Paul's relationship with Christ. We see Paul's relationship with the Philippians. And then the Philippians' relationship with Christ. We see our vertical relationship with Christ. Our horizontal relationship with each other will always be determined by our vertical relationship with Christ. Translation. We will never be in debt, or we will never be in tenderness and compassion with each other if we don't recognize that from Jesus. If we're not in intimacy with Jesus, we won't be in intimacy with one another. Why? Because our relationships on earth follow our relationship with Christ. If it's not right with Christ, it won't be right with people. If it's not right with Christ, it won't be right with people. We may think it's right with people, but it's just a mirage because it's not right with Christ. Again, he starts with his relationship with Christ. Again, if we were to look at the first chapter, Paul prays first to God and then tells the Philippians about it. He prays first and then goes back to talk to the Philippians. Now we start to talk to the Philippians about it this way. Then, make my joy complete. It would seem as though this is a selfish, weird statement, right? This isn't a selfish, weird statement. He said, I want to celebrate with you. I've already talked to you again at the end, at the end of the first chapter. I'm rejoicing with you as you're suffering. Why? Because I'm suffering right alongside you. So right at the beginning, Paul has already created a basis. He's already created a foundation. He's created a foundation, one, because of the grace experience. We all don't deserve the cross. Or, excuse me, we all don't deserve the love of Christ. So their grace experience, but yet he has also built a foundation for them to build upon, but they're suffering together. Because of that, Paul now has credibility. He has an opportunity to step in their life, not to mention the longevity of their relationship. The longevity of their relationship, their grace experience, and the fact that, that they're experiencing suffering together. Paul now says, make my joy complete. I'm rejoicing with you. How? Make my joy complete by being like-minded. This Friends, being like-minded is really the apex. It's really what he says. To live as, to live as Christ in the first chapter and to die as him. To live as Christ and to die as Christ. That's the mindset. We talked about this. Remember the mindset. The, the word here in the Greek literally means a set of the mind. So where the mind sets, really it's a disposition of the heart. Really it's a posture of the heart. So where I find my heart where I find my mind, what he's saying here is, make my joy complete by being like-minded. My question for our community, answer this question, are we, is the community known as the realm, are we like-minded? Are we like-minded? Are we finding unity in Christ? Find our unity through what Christ has done for us, and the outpouring of what Christ is doing, are we like-minded? Mind. He says, make my joy complete 
being like-minded. Take it a posture in a disposition of like-mindedness. Having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. So we see his vertical relationship, now we see the horizontal relationship. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Is our community being one in spirit and in purpose? Larger question, is the church in St. Louis being like-minded in the same love, united in purpose? That's my question. Is the church in St. Louis being like-minded, being of the same purpose together? Is the church in St. Louis being this? I had a conversation with Brian Bennett student pastor at Calvary. Brian Bennett has been a great friend in my life, and he's come to be an incredible encourager for me. We, we had a conversation last week, last Wednesday, and, and we just began to dream. And really this dream, this conversation has been happening for quite some time when we started St. Louis World last year. We really the dream was that we're on the same team. So just cutting to the chase and we share like we're on the same team and we believe that the crossover of students that we have that know some of the students who go to Calvary and some of the students that know some of our students who come to the realm, like we believe, like we're in this together. My question is, when's the last time you prayed for another church locally? When's the last time you passed another church locally and we prayed for them instead of immediately thoughts of competition coming to mind, immediately thoughts of we're better than that coming to mind, immediately thoughts of, like, when's the last time you prayed for another church? When's the last time you prayed for another student ministry? When's the last time we prayed for another pastor? And really the, the telltale of that is if we're not doing that, we don't understand what it means to be of one spirit, to be like-minded with the same love, united in purpose. We, we don't. We made for this small community, but this small community can only do so much, right? I believe we can do vast amounts of goodness. I believe through Christ, God can empower this community to do unbelievable things. But I believe that when Christ does that to this community, and does it to that community, and does it to that community, and we do it together, I believe it makes more sense. I believe that influence compounds and multiplies when the church just gets it together. Absolutely, right? Now, are there churches who are gospel-centered, who are preaching Jesus? Yes. Are there some that need to be that aren't? Yes. At the end of the day, what does Paul say? I rejoice because Jesus is being preached. I rejoice because the gospel is being shared. Now, whether we agree with the way they do it or not isn't up to us. It's up to the Holy Spirit in that community. So my challenge, as we jump even further, because this is a great point of conviction for us. This ought to be an unbelievable moment of conviction. Are we praying for each other? Are you praying for your friends that go to hell, your friends that go to Harvest of Christian, your friends that go to the crossing, your friends that go, I mean, are we praying for each other and the, and the peeps that we go to other places? Because if we're not, this scripture doesn't make sense to us then. And really, at the end of the day, what's the point of moving forward? Because we move forward, but we're not even doing this yet. And this is the reason why Paul is calling out this church. Now again, he's specifically talking to the community there at Philippi. I'm branching it out overarching to the community in St. Louis. We need to get this right. Because what with the unbelieving world, with the people quote unquote on the outside looking in, this is one of the biggest beefs. The biggest beef is they're hypocrites. They, they backbite each other. They talk bad about each other. I was in an FCA meeting in a small group where kids got in an argument representing four different student ministries, and they began to argue whose student ministry was the best. And some of our students were in that. I was livid. Absolutely livid because that's not the gospel. Why? Because he goes on to say this. Being of one spirit, one purpose, Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is the exact opposite from what he just described. Being like-minded with one purpose, going in the same trajectory. Why? Because that's what Christ did with you, with tenderness and compassion. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider ourselves better than yourselves. This statement this letter being written to this community 
is incredibly provocative. Paul is asking these people who represent Christ to be humble. To be humble at this time, living in a Greco-Roman world, is a stark contrast, is utter contrast to the Greco-Roman world. The Greco-Roman world, to be in humility was to be weaker than, was to be less than. Very similar to how many of you saw the movie 300, how I many of you saw the movie 300? Some people would be like, oh, it's really good. Don't, don't freak out, chill out. It's, it's the Spartans, and you saw the arrogance they had, and you saw the people that they had. I mean, they, they, were, they were arrogant because to be humble was to be less than. To be humble was to be weak. It was to show weakness. In the greco Roman world, it was to, this was unspeakable. You don't do this. Especially living in a Roman colony of what? We know Philippi is made up of, of ex-Roman soldiers. And so ex-Roman soldiers and people who were once, and who were once Gentiles who are now brought back to the truth of the gospel, transformed to be followers of Jesus, for example, do nothing in vain out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in everything, in humility, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Do you see the contrast that Paul is beginning to create? We begin to see a glimpse of the internal relational tension that is beginning to happen in this church. But my question is, do we see others better than ourselves? Do we see others better than ourselves? Real quick, and I'll give you away, because when I start, I don't know how far we're going to get today, but I'll give you away the antidote, the antidote to pride. If you struggle with pride, and I would imagine that the vast majority of us in this room struggle with pride. I would imagine the vast majority of the North American Christians, North Americans in general, struggle with pride. The antidote to pride is humility. You're sitting here saying, well, duh, that's the antithesis of, of pride, right? But humility through the sense of looking at others better than yourself. When we view others better than us, there's no room for pride. When I view you better than me, what does that mean? I'm looking to serve you. I'm looking to raise you up, to put your interests ahead of mine and to serve you. This is stark contrast to North America. In North America, what do we do? We have relationships to see what you can do for me. I want to get to know you because I think you have something that you can do for me. The agenda that happens in relationships. Or I'm going to date you because you roll with this crowd and this does better for my reputation the fact that you're rolling in this crowd. It sounds dumb and it sounds completely ridiculous on the surface, but yet it's absolute reality. And we know it. I wish I was her friend. I wish I was his friend. I wish I did this so that it's all agenda. When, when, when I relate with you for the sake of me, that's not relationship. That's not relationship. That's agenda. In fact, that's selfishness, which again, we talked about this way last year. I believe it's one of the global killers. We think global killers are AIDS and lack of water and, and, and malaria and, and, and hunger. Those aren't global killers. Those are the repercussions of selfishness. Those are the repercussions of the lack of compassion. Those are the repercussions of the lack of awareness that exists. There's no awareness in pride. In fact, that's why there's pride. Because there's no awareness. In fact, the lack of awareness that comes with pride is so obnoxious to everybody else. The proud very rarely have deep friendships. If you struggle with pride right now, look in your life and begin to count how many relationships do I have of death? Probably not any. I do not say few. I said probably not any. Why? Because that relationship is all about you and not about the other people. Without selfish ambition and without vain conceit and only in humility, consider others better than yourself. Why does he say this? Why does he bring this up? Let's continue on. Consider others better than yourself. Verse 4. Each of you should look not only to you, uh, 
introduce you to look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. He's not saying become a doormat. He's not saying completely forget about your dreams, completely forget about your life, completely forget about the things that you're pursuing. He's not saying that. He's saying while you live your life, build others up. While you, while you live your life, make sure you're praying for each other. While you live your life, make sure that you're of the same love, that you're of the same like-mindedness, that you have a disposition of love, that you have a posture of love, that you have a posture of tenderness and compassion. Why? As he gets into this, it gets so rich. Verse 5, your attitude, this word your, really, again, mistranslated almost in the NIV. And I know that sounds really presumptuous saying it's mistranslated. It's just, it misses a little bit here the original. This word your, it's literally, it's community. So yes, we know that a community is made up of individuals, but this is specifically speaking of this community. Your attitude as the church, as the community representing Philippi, as the community representing the realm, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. All of a sudden, he brings it into focus. Why should there not be vain conceit? Why should there not be selfish ambitions? Why should it be in humility? Because our attitude, that word attitude again, very similar to the like-mindedness, the disposition to our posture should be the same as that of Jesus. Verse 6, he moves from the imperative into kind of what a lot of scholars believe in him. Because as he's about to talk about Jesus and the goodness of God's character in Jesus, he begins to overflow with emotion. And he begins what a lot of scholars believe, verses 6 through 11, is a hymn. He's just, it's just an exclamation of the overflow. When he talks about Jesus, he cannot not, he cannot just worship. Now, this isn't a hymn in the liturgical sense of the hymn. This is a hymn in every mindset of, of, of the poetic nature of the next few verses. We're going to go through these pretty quickly. But verse 6, who be in the very nature of God. This word very nature literally means the form or it means the shape. So, at the, at the beginning, he lets everybody know of, of good theology. He lets everybody know that Jesus is fully divine. He being in the very nature God. He is fully God. He is fully divine. He wants everybody to know that up front. Yet, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. This word grasp literally means to be clenched or to be held on to. Literally what this means is to be taken advantage of. So Jesus... In this moment, what Paul is trying to communicate, what Paul is essentially saying is, Jesus didn't take advantage of the fact that he was God. He didn't take advantage of the fact that when Satan walks up to him and says, throw yourself off the cliff when he tries to tempt him, then Jesus says, I'm God, let's, it's showtime, let's do this. And he doesn't, Jesus doesn't throw himself off the cliff so that the angels can come and save him, as was what he was tempted to do. But instead, being fully God, yet, as it says, verse 7, but made himself nothing. Made himself nothing, taking the very nature. Again, we see the word very nature, the phrase, of a servant being made in human likeness. Fully God, yet not taking advantage of the fact that he's God, steps into humanity through humility, through obedience. We see Jesus in utter obedience. And who's obedient? Servants are obedient. Servants are humble because they're obedient because they find themselves underneath their master. Jesus, in a point, in a place of utter obedience, finds himself yet fully God, but not taking advantage of the fact that he's God, completely becoming human. Good theology. By the way, early on in the first 300 to 200 to 100, as you step back in history, A.D., this was one of the biggest issues in the world. How could Jesus be fully man and fully human? How could Jesus be, excuse me, fully God and fully human? How can he be fully divine? And how can he be human? People couldn't wrap their brains around this. And so this became a massive point of tension. This became a massive point where that doesn't make sense. And so council after council, the council of Trent, the council of Nicaea, over and over and over again, they argued this specific thing. Paul, making sure that everybody knows, he humbled himself. Why? So that the people on the outside would know who he is. Continue on. Verse 8. Man, there's so much more, there's so much more than this in there. Remember the first, remember the first chapter we talked about. This is verses 6 through 8 is what Paul says essentially this is what it means to know Christ. 
Remember that, remember that phrase, fruit of righteousness? Remember why we're supposed, our love is to abound more and more so that we can have a depth of knowledge and a depth of insight. Why? So that the fruit of righteousness may show itself. The fruit of righteousness literally is a picture of Christ in verses 6 through 8. To take the path of the cross. When we take the path of the cross to have the same attitude as that of Christ, the fruit of righteousness begins to appear. Why? Because we esteem others better than ourselves because humility begins to make sense. And when you speak of humility here, it's important that we understand that this isn't a false sense of humility. I can walk around and say that I think others are better than me. I can walk around and I can, I can say, man, I'm, I'm humble. That's, that's my favorite train of opera. Just and, and so, but I can walk around and, and I, can, I can have fake and pseudo and false humility. That's, that's not what he's talking about. Remember, your attitude, your disposition, your posture, your mindset should be that of Christ. And what really humility here is, is recognizing, yes, our weaknesses. We need to recognize our weaknesses. So my question, do you recognize your weaknesses? Do you recognize your weaknesses? Again, someone who's not proud has awareness. When we have a sense of self-awareness, we recognize the places that we fall short. And the places that we fall short that should bring humility. Right? Our inadequacies should always bring humility. Why? Because God gives gifts. Gifts are always meant to display our inadequacies. We should recognize our weaknesses and be humbled that despite our weaknesses, the Bible says our weaknesses are made perfect for God. And so humility, we should recognize our weaknesses, but we also need to remember that if we call ourselves followers of Christ, if the gospel is legitimately transforming our life, we are holy. So, in the truest sense of the word humility here, yes, we recognize our weaknesses, but our weaknesses don't define our identity. Our identity, identity is defined by the gospel. Our identity is defined by what Christ did on the cross for us. And so in this moment, the, in the true sense of the word humility, I know that I, I know that I have weaknesses and shortcomings, yet that Christ died so that I would be made perfect or that I would be made holy and I would be made righteous. His righteousness comes on me, the dirt and the filth come off, so that he would get all the glory. Go back to chapter one. So that he would get all the glory. This is what it means to be humble. This is the, the humility there. It's not a false sense of humility. Verse 8. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Recognize the language here. The language here is very reminiscent of Eden. The language here is very reminiscent of a mad old day. So we need to recognize our identity. We need to recognize what we were originally created for. We were originally created to be in union, to be in intimacy with our Creator. The word humility in the Old Testament literally means creature recognizing who he is to the Creator. Through obedience, creature recognizing who he is to the Creator. At that moment, the creature recognizes his dependence or her dependence. Humility is recognizing our weaknesses, but knowing that through Christ, there is intimacy. Through Christ, there is righteousness. It's also recognizing our dependence. When we recognize our dependence on Jesus, we know at that moment we must trust. So disciples are humble. Again, the question, we often ask the wrong questions. We often ask the, the, the questions of, how do I become humble? How do I become humble? Probably isn't the right question. The better question potentially may be, who is humble? People who are humble are disciples. Disciples find themselves where? At the feet of Jesus. They're at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because they're disciples and at the feet of Jesus. They hang out every word Jesus says. You want to be humble? Become a disciple. There's not seven steps in this letter on how to be more humble. Notice Paul is saying, you want to be humble? Become a disciple. And what does a disciple do? A disciple becomes like his master. A disciple looks like his master. If you want to be humble, become like Jesus. Take the path of descent. Humble yourself down. Follow obedience. 
Our language from Luke 9, 23 will put, daily take up your cross and follow me. Then we will walk in lives and lifestyle of humility. If you struggle with humility, confession, I tell you guys this all the time. I do, over and over again. I've got a critical spirit. I've got a judgmental spirit. I'm always looking and criticizing and judging and saying, you should have done this, or I would have done this, or it would have been better this way. It's so easy for me to do that. For me, the antidote to that is becoming a disciple to continue to press into the gospel and taking the path of dissent. If you struggle with humility, if you struggle with humility and pride, is always prominent in your life. Lift others up. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Lift others up. Lift others up. This is why Jesus wasn't afraid to hang out with prostitutes. He wasn't afraid to hang out with tax collectors. He wasn't afraid to hang out with demon possessed men. He wasn't afraid to hang out to, to hang out with lepers and the people who were lame, the people who were blind. Which, by the way, all of these things were thought to have been a sin issue. That's why they happened. Jesus wasn't afraid to hang out with sinners. Why? Because he lifted people up. What an amazing story. That if somebody thought of you, or if somebody thought of me, they immediately thought of you. Every time I think of that person, every time I think of you, I'm encouraged because every time I'm around you, you lift me up. You always put me ahead of before. You always serve me. You better believe that when you begin to serve people, people are going to want to be, are, are also going to want to serve. Why? Because it's contagious. Why? Because it just makes sense. It just makes sense. Are you struggling with pride? Serve. Serve. Again, going to Isaiah 58, and I know I'm off on a little tangent, but going back to Isaiah 58, we sit back and we say, I'll serve when I get my crap together, right? Over and over again, the church says, I'll serve when I get my crap together. I'll serve when I'm ready to serve. What does Isaiah 58 say? No, no. Serve, and you'll find your healing. Lift people up, and you'll find humility. Not in the false sense, but in the truest sense. Why? Because that's what Christ did. Who is humble? Disciples are humble. Here we go. Verse 9. Therefore, God exalted himself. He talks in verse 68 as kind of the cross. And then in verses 9 through 11, he exalts Christ. Verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And he borrows Isaac from Isaiah chapter 45 here that the name of Christ, every name will bow and in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember, this is a, he's explaining this. This is coming from the overflow of just who he is because he's talking about Jesus. When he talks about Jesus, he's just thankful and he prays and he worships. Why? Because it's just who he is. Is. He just gets off of this and immediately verse 12 jumps into, therefore, since we just talked about Christ and we saw that Christ's life is just riddled in humility, again, if you want to follow Christ, you need to be disciple. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, again, he's proud of them. He's giving them props because up to this point, they've done a good job. In fact, they've done a great job. But he's not satisfied with them doing a good job. He's not even satisfied with them doing a great job. His prayer is that the love will bomb even further in fullness. His, his goal and his hope and his prayer is that the Philippian church would pursue fullness. My dear friends, I think it's always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in your absence. The, the language here shifts to obedience. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. One of the, one of the biggest verses that's taken out of context in all of Scripture. In all of Scripture, over and over again. So continue to work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does Paul mean? It's actually quite simple what Paul's trying to communicate here. What he's trying to communicate is obedience always happens at the individual level. Church always happens at the individual level. So as individuals, we make up the church. As individuals, we make up the community. As the individuals are obedient, the community is obedient. Obedience always takes place at an individual level. What does that mean? You cannot rely on the person next to you to be obedient for you. The person sitting next to you, as you look at them, you cannot rely upon their life to be obedient 
for you. So what he's trying to tell the Philippian church at this point is, so, since Christ humbled himself, died on the cross, has shifted and, and made reconciliation, the strange relationship between humanity and God, righteousness is bestowed on you, your identity is now found in the gospel because of that, continue to work out your salvation, meaning live your life for Jesus. Because when you live your life for Jesus, there's going to be moments we have to wrestle, right? That's why he said last chapter, this is why we must discern what is best. Because we can do a lot of things, but is it the best thing to do? And again, this is, the, this is the point that parents don't like this part, and even pastors don't necessarily like this part, because what is best is going to be different for you, and what's going to be different for you, what's going to be different for you, which is going to be different for you. Well, we all want to sit here and say, we have to do it this way. Paul's saying, no, get as close as you can to Jesus and your intimacy with Jesus so that you know what to do for you because that's what he's telling you to do. Obedience happens on an individual level. Can, at, a, at an individual level, continue to work out your obedience. Excuse me, continue to work out your salvation. Continue to work, continue to journey, continue to process, continue in the process of sanctification, the theological nuance, essentially what's happening in this text. Continue to work that out. It's not works, but as I live life in obedience. As I live life in obedience, I'm going to, salvation is going to continue to make more and more sense. Translation, as I live in obedience, the gospel will make more and more sense. As I live in obedience, Jesus will make more and more sense. As I live in obedience, the church will make more and more sense. What are you trying to say? So when I don't live in obedience, Jesus makes less and less sense. When I don't live in obedience, the gospel begins to make less and less sense. And when I don't live in obedience, the church begins to make less and less sense. He's telling the community in Philippi to work out your salvation by living for Jesus and humble obedience. Essentially what Paul is saying, what's the main concern? The main concern is that they become the people of God in Philippi. What's the main concern? Is that this community represents Christ, that we become the people of God in St. Charles. That's the main thrust of this letter. How do we do that? Through humble obedience. Verse 13, for it is God who works. And just in case you took out of context, just in case if we take out of context, verse 12, he brings the essential theology back in verse 13, verse 13 for it is God who works in you. So if we think that it's got anything to do with me with working out my salvation, let me remind you, it's God who works through you to will and to act accordingly to his good purpose. We're going to stop here. We're going to stop here. We're going to stop at verse 13. The band's going to come out. We're going to respond to this moment and just worship here. Essentially what, essentially what Paul is trying to say here is he's got, trying to give a good picture of pure love. And in a world where we're confused with love, in a world where love has just become something that, that has just confused on an individual level. He's trying to take the ambiguity out of pure love. So, so what you're saying is, I should do this, I should do this, I should, no. What I'm saying is you should live like Christ. Well, Paul, what do you mean? What I'm saying is you should humble yourself. And in the process of humbling yourself, become a disciple, in the process of becoming a disciple, lift others up. Lift others up. Go ahead, close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes real quick. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Just a point. Again, anytime we open up the scriptures, we always must respond. The scriptures have been opened up to us. There's a little, there's a little sense of flatness tonight. Just be thinking, spring break, again, tired, trying to figure out what we're going to do after this, trying to figure out how we're going to hang, trying to figure out what. In this moment, the scriptures have been opened up to us. And again, if, if you're like me, if you're like me, I'm completely slapped across the face and my heart ripped out because my life does not signify humility like this. I've been struggling and wrestling with this letter for the past four weeks, realizing the chasm that exists between my life 
and the life of Paul. So when I say the life of Paul, it represents Christ. That's why later on in another book, in another book Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. How many of us tonight can say, imitate me as I imitate Christ? I would love to say that, but in some ways I'd say, who do you take me? Because I'm just not there. So my, my question tonight is this. Has there been humility in your life? Has humility been a habit in your life? Has lifting other people up been a habit in your life? Or is life strictly just about you? Is life just about me? And what I want out of it. Look at your relationships real quick. Your relationships. Are those relationships for you or for lifting the other person up? I would say this is where we struggle with relationship. Which, by the way, is the exact same place that the church in Philippi is struggling with relationship. They're having a hard time lifting each other up. And since we're having a hard time lifting each other up, it's not making much sense. It's not making much sense. But yet, the gospel is still advancing. How much more sense would it make if we lifted one another up? So tonight, really, I guess the prayer is simple tonight. My, my, my prayer for, for me, my prayer for you, my prayer for us would be at an individual level. What does obedience look like tonight? For you specifically, what does obedience look like tonight? Obedience always happens on an individual level. And the collection of the individuals being obedient makes up our community. Tonight, what does obedience look like for you? What will your obedience response be to life, to this life of Christ? And how will we serve the people that God's put in our life? How will we lift them up? How will we build them up? How will we put them and, and assume they're better than we are. Again, not better out of false sense of humility, but better because that's, that's the way Christ lived. And so, Father, tonight is, is we just take a moment to respond. Father, in my own life, I pray that you continue to convict the depths of my heart, that you continue to convict the moments and the times that, I'm, that it just becomes about me. I'm not serving the people that you place. Father, teach me how to serve my wife better. Teach me how to serve my sons better. Teach me how to serve this community better. Father, teach me how to be thankful more. Teach me how to live without selfish ambition, without vain conceit. But Father, but do everything in humility. Father, what would a life like that look like? Father, I want to know. I want to know. Father, you give us a clear picture. That's a life of the disciples. So, Father, can you continue to, to make me a disciple? Father, can I continue to take just another step tonight in what it means to be a disciple after you? Amen. 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 Amen.
wants you to sing this song, I Will Live.
salvation and fear and trembling. Yes, the angel is saying, work out with fear and trembling. That word fear and trembling again, as we go back to Proverbs, it says, this is a humble awareness. It's this, it's this reverence and awe, and that's our worshipful response. And so even as we just respond, and man, I'm going to ask you guys to do a quick change. If that's cool, man, can we end one more time with salvation this year? Because I feel like I feel like as we leave this place tonight, again, we just need another reminder as we leave this place, as, as we work out our salvation as a community in, in fear and trembling. Paul says in fear and trembling because he wants them to recognize the urgency. He wants them to recognize the urgency that the outside world literally needs to see Jesus in the flesh. The outside world looking from the outside in, they, they literally need to see a community who represents the cross. And so we need to recognize, we need to remember that salvation is here, yes, but it's active and it's alive and it's working in us and it's working through us as we leave this place. As we leave this place, Paul goes on to say that you begin to shine like stars. You begin to shine like stars when we put away vain conceit, when we put away selfish ambitions, when we learn to not do anything with complaining. Or, or not to bright. All of a sudden, and as Jesus shines through, this community begins to shine like stars in a world of darkness. So in a world of darkness, we need to recognize the urgency. But in the urgency that we recognize, we remember and we understand through fear and trauma and the urgency, yes, but just the, 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 the awe and the wonder and, and, and the, the obedient response to that. So as we leave tonight, let's just celebrate tonight that salvation is here. Let's just celebrate tonight that God is active and alive among us, and he wants to use this community to do great things. Not for us. Why? Paul bring, always brings back to the glory of God. So tonight, as we leave this place, and I'll just have just two announcements on the, on the back end, but as we leave this place, man, let's just remember through explaining, just as, a, as an outward expression of what's happening to him, that salvation is here, man. So if we can, let's just end that one real quick. Thanks, guys.